You're listening to Voice Actor Showcase, episode number 34. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Voice Actor Showcase, a podcast about voice actors and their stories. I'm Jun Yoon. Please connect with us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Voice Actor Show. These episodes are also available on youtube.com slash voicemoto. The Voice Actor Showcase is about the stories of everyday voice actors from around the world sharing their stories from their individual journeys. And if you have an interesting story and you've been patiently waiting for the audience ID for to be back in stock like many, many other voice actors, I'd love to have you on the show to share your story. Please contact us by visiting voiceactorshowcase.com. And while you're there, please check out the store and pick up an introverted voice actor t-shirt or a Get Mike, Get Money, Get Tacos t-shirt for yourself or your favorite voice actor. The sales from the store will go to supporting the show as well as paying the voice actors in future episodes. Today, we'll meet a voice actor from right here in Los Angeles. Born and raised in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and then in Austin, Texas, he grew up with cartoons in the 80s and the 90s, absolutely fascinated by the voices he'd heard. After starting his artistic journey as an artist, he let life take its course, allowing him to experience filmmaking and acting, which then eventually led to voice acting. Now living and working in Los Angeles, he had worked in various films, television shows, and voiceover projects. He's the English voice of Baal in Welcome to Demon School Irumakun, leaky-eyed Luca in JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Golden Wind, and my personal favorite, Rack Wraithraiser in Tower of God. This is going to be a great conversation. Please welcome Matthew David Rudd. You're both awake. Good. You. Tell me your name so we can get to know each other better. Oh, if it isn't a bonny brace of wee barnyard animals. Care to share me potatoes? Them's fighting words. Taking heavy fire! We'll start here, on the outskirts of the city. Securing the building and taking him alive. Sniper! Take cover! If I can finish my play here. I'll have my advance from the theater. And then I'll send money. But I can't seem to write a goddamn thing in this dying city. Oh, I hope you brought an appetite because tonight, on the menu, we serve you. Let's spice things up. Screw it up and I'll kill you. Matthew David Rudd. Hello, sir. Welcome to the show. How are you? Hey, I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. <laughs> How are you spending your quarantine these days? Oh, you know, um, I'm either... <laughs> I do, actually. <laughs> we, we, we were having this conversation a second ago, but I've got two answers to that. Um, I, I'm full-time dadding right now because I have a five-year-old who's home from school, so I'm you know, spending the majority of my day making sure he's zooming in for classes or, you know, entertained or not pulling the dog's tail, uh, <laughs> you know, stuff like that. And then, uh, you know, I'm also doing my work. So I've got a, uh, a closet that I've converted into a, a sound booth. Um, and so I'm either I'm either in here sweating off calories or I am uh, <laughs> out there, you know, entertaining my son. And it, it's been it's been crazy, uh, but it's been fun. You know, I'm glad I have my family here to keep me sane. I, I have I have a lot of friends who are by themselves right now, and yeah. uh, you know, it's it's nice to have family, even though it's a little bit crazy. Uh, it, it is nice to have other people around. <sighs> what a relief that is too, just to have somebody around. Yeah, yeah, I can't imagine the the solo solo flying people that are who are in their apartments and houses right now. Yikes! Right, right. All right, let's just dive right into it. Um, you were born in Albuquerque, New Mexico, uh, growing up loving cartoons like the most of us. Talk mm -hmm. to us about your childhood, family dynamics, school situation, cartoons. I think my <laughs> kids just came home. The boom, boom, boom. Yep, they came home. <laughs> That's what <laughs> that rumble was. <laughs> yeah, you hear them rumbling outside through the door. <laughs> <gasps> yeah. Daddy's recording. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I grew up in New Mexico. Uh, which is interesting because now there's a really thriving film community there. 
I, I know I, I, it's all started kind of around the time of Breaking Bad. Um, the Marvel <laughs> movies, the, fir- the first phase of Marvel movies were mostly shot out of New Mexico. Huh. Um, all of this happened after I was out of New Mexico, uh, which is interesting. I, I, I went to <laughs> I, I went to Florida for art school. I moved to Austin, Texas, um, where you know where I got into to to film and stuff. And right as I was kind of you know, breaking into my career, I had friends that had stayed in New Mexico the whole time, and they were really kind of thriving because of this community that had that had cropped up, you know, out of nowhere. Huh. Um, but when I was a kid. Uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, it, it, you know, it's I'm, I'm. This is how I talk, June. I, it, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be jumping all over no, the place. That's but, good. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> but uh, but Albuquerque, New Mexico is, is a sprawling southwestern city. And when when I first moved to LA, I was actually kind of shocked. I was like, oh, this is kind of just like Albuquerque. You know, <laughs> I was expecting New York City, or I was expecting you know so, a giant city. <laughs> but it's so sprawling, and and it really reminded me of home. Um, so, so Albuquerque, New Mexico, is this southwestern sprawling city. A lot of, a lot of my love of drawing and art and cartoons really comes from that environment um, because the Native American influence is so heavy there in the Southwest, and the and the Mexican uh, influence is so heavy there. I was exposed to all this amazing traditional artwork, sculptures, uh, ink paintings, things like that. Nice. That really. Um, you know, I don't know how nerdy we want to get, but when I was growing up and Cartoon Network was starting and the, the real, it's kind of a, it was kind of a golden age of 2D animation, you know, I'd say through from maybe the early nineties through the, the mid two thousands with, with, you know, Batman and Transformers and, you know, it was just a real golden age. And, and I saw real parallels between, uh, the Native American two-dimensional art style that I fell in love with growing up and like, uh, you know, Samurai Jack, especially uh, the, those yeah. Tartakovsky cartoons that were so graphic and so flat and so gestural. Um, anyway, you can hear from my, you know, <laughs> from my I mean, rambling here that, that I, really del- I, I really dove into that and I really understood it and 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 just grew up wanting to get behind the scenes and wanting to see how it was all made and all that sort of stuff which eventually led to to this job that I'm doing where I'm I am behind the scenes I I am a part of the process and and it's you know it's it's a it's an awesome kind of full circle thing nice favorite favorite cartoon when you were a kid <laughs> I mean, it really depends on the day. Uh, talk to Ryan sometime about me or, or talk to any of my, you know, super close friends. Any given day, I will t- send them a text message about what my absolute favorite thing in the world is at the moment. And it changes daily. Um, but but really, I mean, I already mentioned Samurai Jack. Yeah. I really had a a affinity for Tartakovsky. Um, uh, sorry, hmm. Tartakovsky. Uh, animation and he was he was really kind of influential in the beginning of Cartoon Network. So so Samurai Jack, Powerpuff Girls, um Dexter's Lab uh were huge, but even before that, I mean Batman the animated series was I, I can look at that and 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 see such a seminal thing for me. It, it combined so many of the things that I loved, uh you know, Kevin Conroy's voice, Mark Hamill's voice. Uh, the actual art style again. It was it was kind of this golden age of two two D traditional animation. Yeah. Um, and and the storytelling. Um, it's interesting because I mean I'm sure you see this having kids of your own, but we're kind of coming back into a real depth of storytelling in cartoons that I haven't seen since I was a kid, and and I think it's because you know. People our age grew up with those, and they're now the ones creating the cartoons. Yep. But there was a whole there was a whole time period, you know, in the early two thousands when we had, and I'm not disparaging these cartoons at all because they're all wonderful in their own right. But we had like SpongeBob, and we had, you know, it was like it was like Foster's Home for Imaginary. Uh, I, I can't even remember the last uh, creatures. <laughs> um, but there was a whole slew of cartoons that became that kind of became these eleven minute clips of goofiness. And um, I, I, I don't know where I was going with this conversation, but no, I'll but, say it. I didn't like them. I, yeah, you know, I didn't like them at all. Yeah, yeah, but so I, you know, I feel really fortunate that I grew up with the ones that I had. Yeah, 
And I saw, I saw, you know, a shift away from that as I was getting into my college years and and early adulthood. And it's really kind of cool now to have a five-year-old at this point in time, because in the 2010s and 2020s now, we are seeing a shift back where I have friends from college who are now showrunners on on these uh, Nickelodeon shows, Cartoon Network shows, and and you know work at at uh, Disney Animation and Lucasfilm. You know, people I went to art school with, and they grew up with the same stuff that I grew up with. <laughs> so they are producing stuff that is similar in the depth of storytelling and the, and the quality of animation. You know, they're not cutting the same corners that some of those early two thousands cartoons did. And, you know, so that's all just to say that, you know, it's it's great to be part of this crop of cartoons, you know, getting to lend my voice to these things because it is so reminiscent of what was influential for me when I was growing up. Yeah. And you got to wonder if your kids will grow up and start like watching you know, oh, that's dad's voice. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> you, you know, it's funny. I know we'll talk about Rock later, but Rock Razor is the first instance where my son will ask for it by name. He said <laughs> it, it's the first because he's grown up not knowing any other life than that I do this for a living. He thinks that my job is to go into the closet and record things. <laughs> uh, he calls everything that I do an audition. So he, whether oh. I'm going whether I'm going to a studio and recording or I'm on a film set or whatever, he'll be like, oh, hey, dad, did you enjoy your audition today? You know, <laughs> um, <laughs> but so so. This, but Rock is the first character who he has really seen some sort of connection for, and you really see that he is connecting the dots that oh, that is my dad's voice. Mm. Um, and so, and and it's coming out weekly on Crunchyroll, which is funny because he's he's part of this generation that's used to Netflix binging and and all of that, <laughs> and so he is so devastated every time an episode ends, and he has to wait a whole nother episode or a whole nother week to watch the yeah. next episode. You know, yeah. yeah. Wow, what a trip. Oh, yeah, my gosh. Yeah. It, it is fun. It's uh, Unfortunately for me, with the type of voice that I have and the type of characters that I have played so far and, and enjoy playing, they're really more adult-themed. And so, uh, so Jonah, my son, doesn't really get to enjoy a lot of my work because it's, you know, e- even, even Tower of God is... I mean, it's pushing it. There, there's, there's curse yeah. words in it and stuff like that. But I let him watch it because he is just so enamored with the idea that you know that's me and everything. And so, <laughs> you know, that's probably the the hardest you know PG thirteen thing that he's ever watched. You know, and I and I might be a terrible dad for letting him watch it, but anyway. <laughs> nah, I don't think so. As long as you promise to tell me that you're also in the, uh, you that you also love to eat chocolate bars as Rock does. <laughs> I yes, I, I of course I do. Um, <laughs> of course you do. Yes, <laughs> I, I only I only hesitate because now I am thirty five and everything that I eat shows on my body. So uh, <sighs> Same. I, I I had this great yeah. conversation with Ryan when uh, when I first got cast as Rock, rock um, and and I'm gonna keep he- uh, stuttering when I say his name because when I auditioned for. Rock Wraith Razor, which is the pr- the correct pronunciation as far as I'm told, I auditioned as Rack Wraith Razor. Oh no! <laughs> and and so for the first few months of the process of this, the directors and myself were all calling him Rack. Yeah. And then eventually we got notes back from the studio or from the <laughs> uh, the, the production team saying. We want to change the name to Rock, or or we want to standardize standardize the pronunciation to Rock. And so I always want to say Rack, and I go back and forth. Anyway, um, I told you I'm going to be jumping around. <laughs> no, I think random that's awesome. thoughts here. I I hope you drop a few racks here and there. That'd be <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> yeah, but yes, yeah, so when, when I first got cast as Rock, uh, I said to Ryan, "So now I have to." St- continue, you know, working out every day because I don't want to show up to a convention or something as the, <laughs> you know, playing this awesome giant beast of a man that that I'm, you know, that I feel so lucky to play. And I don't want, you know, I don't want to go and be some like slobby guy. I got to, I got to look the part. <laughs> right. That's the guy? What <laughs> yeah. the heck? Yeah. <laughs> we want our money back. <laughs> Let's let's talk about that just a little bit, actually. Um, okay. The other day, I saw that you had made a spear. Oh yeah. Tell me about that. So 
you know, we, we kind of touched on this part of my whole journey. You know, I, I went to art school and, I, and I'm an artist, uh, you know, I, drawing and painting again, growing up in New Mexico with this love of, you know, traditional artwork. I went to art school. I got a, a bachelor's of fine art uh, with a with a specificity in uh, in illustration. Mm. And for years after art school, I was teaching um, and I, I, I realized that, uh, you know, through, you know, practicing different forms of art, that sculpture was really something that I like. And also just being a nerd, I, I, I took that sculpture affinity to, uh, you, you know, into prop making where I would, uh, you know, I'm, I've been making lightsabers and I've got Thor's hammer and, and, and all these things that I that I make and I taught students how to make. I, I spent a long time, about 10 years teaching art. And uh, and it was always uh, creating props for theater department or or creating the sets for the theater department or, you know, things like that. Cool. And, and again, just, just to service my own, you know, selfish need to to make these nerdy props that I love. <laughs> um, so, so I have displayed throughout my house. Um, I have like... Uh, staffs from Star Wars. I, I have lightsabers. I have Thor's hammer. I have blasters. I, you know, just wow. things that I've made throughout the years. And so, you know, the, the nerd in me would have made this anyway. But the of fact course. that the fact that I'm playing rock, I, the first thing <laughs> I, I said is, is I have to make you know that spear. And and my intention would be to, you know, to show up to cons with it and to, you know, let my fans, you know, wield it and and, and play with it and stuff like that. Um, but, yeah, so, I mean, it was it's uh, it's a process that I've kind of created myself where I can use uh, spray foam and spray it onto a PVC pipe pipe and then uh, carve it into what looks very much like natural carved wood. Nice. And so, uh, so yeah, I've got this awesome replica Rock Wraith Razor spear now just kind of leaning on my wall at my house. <laughs> <laughs> and that lucky fan that gets to hold it and pose with you at a con in the, in the near yeah. future. Oh, how I made, cool I made is it that? very, very durable. You know, this is something that I want to make sure that, that I can pass around. It's not like precious. It, you know, it, it'll take some beating. I can already see the expression on the TSA agent's face when you uh, bring that through. <laughs> yeah, I, I thought about all of that because you know it's like seven feet tall. This is a huge thing, um, <laughs> and so I've got it in in certain uh, hidden areas. It can pull apart and and break down into smaller pieces, so I can you know get it onto a plane or or whatever. Nice, nice. <laughs> what a rebel. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, so you ended up pursuing art uh, in, in college. Um, why art? Um, I mean, yes, influenced <laughs> by the the culture yeah, and yeah. whatnot. But you were also for for me, it was it was not a question. And and from I mean, you know, if you if you interviewed my parents at any point, uh, there was no question that that huh. fr from an early age, that's what I was gonna do. Um, and, and like I told you, you know, I. When I would watch Disney movies as a child or when I would watch Jurassic Park or when I would watch all these things, the first thing I did after seeing the movie is look up any behind the scenes information that I could find and, and learn Aww. how they, you know, how they animated the, the dinosaurs or, you know, the puppetry they used for the dinosaurs or, you know, how the uh, blend of computer animation and traditional animation, you know, produced Beauty and the Beast and, you know, you know things like that. My, my parents were constantly you know, seeing me do these things and, and research these things. And this was before the internet, you know, I, I, I said I'm 35. And, and so when I was a 10 year old kid, the internet didn't exist. Encyclopedia. Yeah, yeah. So I was either, <laughs> I was either, you know, waiting for these TV specials to show up or I was renting, you know, uh, VHS tapes oh, of wow. like behind the scenes stuff. And, you know, honestly, I spent a lot of time, uh, like importing things or, or finding things that people had burned onto CDs and, 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 you know, buying them that they would mail to me that, sh that showed behind the scenes stuff. You know, it wasn't like, <laughs> you know, it wasn't like now where they're just included in the, in the DVD or the digital download or whatever. Right. Um, but so, so anyway, long story short, you know, that, that was just how my brain worked. When I saw something, I wanted to know how it was made. Um, and, and drawing and, and designing and building was, was just, that's just who I am. Wow. Um, and, and so so there was no question. I mean, there was nothing else that I, I can't even begin to imagine what I would be doing in life if it weren't art related. Yeah. You know, there, there's just nothing else for me. 
I'm just, I'm just really curious on how your affinity for art and artistic expression led you to filmmaking and then to voice acting. Well, again, it was, um, it was knowing how things were made, you know, that really drove me. And initially, art was the most uh, accessible thing to me. You know, I, I could see how a drawing was made. You know, I was a good artist. I could draw. I could paint. Um, and I could see the very clear transition between, you know, 2D drawing to 2D animation and and so on. You know, things like that. I could see oh. where where that path led. And, uh, you know, I know you and I talked about it, but, but you know, when I was at college age, it was comic books. I was, you know, I could see where 2D animation was kind of going by the wayside at that point. You know, 3D animation was the big thing when I was getting into college. Mm. But I like drawing. And so the way that I could see a path to, uh, you know, expressing myself through illustration and 2D uh, drawings was into comic books. And, you know, so that was the realm that I was really excited about with uh, w when I was in college. But in college, you know, I was exposed to all sorts of different art forms. You know, that's when I started sculpting for the first time. And, <sighs> um, and, and that's when I started uh, making films for the first time. I, I took filmmaking classes in college, even though that wasn't my major. You know, I was just exposed to lots of different things. And honestly, that became... Again, I'm going to use the word accessibility. It was so uh -huh. easy at that point. We were, we were just transitioning into digital media at that point in time. And it was so easy just to pick up a digital camera, shoot some stuff for a night, and then in the editing room, make it into something beautiful, you know? Mm. And, uh, and it just became clear. And I, I think if you talk to any sort of content creator, it just it becomes clear that audio is so important. Mm -hmm. You know, and especially in the days, you know, we're in the YouTube era right now in the Netflix era, you can have a video that's that's loading or buffering and it's got this terrible pixelated quality <laughs> and it's OK. You know, yeah. by, by today's standards, that's OK. A kid will sit through a, an entire show that's in like 480p. But if you can't hear it or if you can't, if the audio's crackly or, you know, that aspect of it, that ruins the whole experience for you. Um. And so, again, with my understanding of that and my, you know, inquisitive nature and my wanting to pick things apart, I really started studying kind of audio and how I could help the films sound better. Um, I got involved in a lot of indie projects when I was in Austin. And, uh, and that's where I just jumped in to help. You know, I, I understood hmm. where the microphone needed to be placed to get the best audio. I understood what I needed to capture and not capture so that in the editing room I could make it sound good. And, um, and, and, and that led to just me doing those sorts of things, learning about audio editing and, and audio production. And uh, that just kind of gave me a leg up in this, uh, you know, I've, again, I, sa I said since I was young, I was always interested in the voices of these characters. Right. And um, I'm I'm trying to think when I just when it just clicked to me and I started deciding to submit to things. Yeah. But uh, you know I don't really have a clear answer to that. It was some time around ten or fifteen years ago, and I just started submitting to things and I started doing uh, I started doing like uh, independent projects and and no paying projects, which I you know I quickly discovered as everyone does in in contract work that those have their issues. <laughs> Right. And, uh, you know, because I was such a good editor, I was able to take stuff and make it sound appropriate for the level for the next level of where I wanted to be. You know what I'm saying? Um, rather than spend a lot of time wallowing in in the first stages of, of, of auditioning or the first stages of this career, I was able to edit my stuff to make it the quality that you would expect from a professional uh, voiceover demo or the or a professional reel you know, things like that yeah which always kind of gave me the leg up understanding how to how to edit and how to how to pick these things apart kind of always gave me the leg up and and I feel just you know things moved fast because I was able to make them happen for myself in that way I didn't have to <laughs> wait for uh, someone else to edit my work or someone else to tell me what was appropriate for for the the demo reels and things like that because 
I was always working to make those things better myself. It it sounds like to me that you are very much a yes and kind of a person.、Uh, you had a direction in the in the you had a direction in the direction of art certainly, but it wasn't. I'm going to be an artist and nothing else. It was like I. Discovered this, I'm gonna try this. So I discovered this, I'm gonna get better at it and teach myself editing and acting and voiceover, filming, and then here you are. Yeah, and you, you know, you know, being a teacher、uh, for such a long time,、uh, really, you're absolutely right, and and it really cemented this idea in my brain that that、uh, the kids needed to know that if you know how to think for yourself and you know how to be creative, the world is just your oyster, you know. It, rather than specializing in one thing and only being good at that one thing, and then expecting the world to do the other things for you so that you can be good at that one thing, you need to be able to think creatively and build or create or、uh, manipulate your your existence so that you can keep moving forward. Whether or not the rest of the world is ready for it. Speaking of moving forward, you <laughs> moved to Austin, Texas. What was that? What 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 did you? What prompted that decision? Well, so、uh, I met my wife in、uh, in Florida when we were in art school.、Uh, I met her within weeks of starting school, and、uh, we started dating immediately.、Um, and her parents are from、uh, Central Texas, and so we had spent time, you know. Visiting them in the Austin area, and really just decided that once we got married, we were gonna we were gonna live in Austin.、Um, and there there wasn't anything, there wasn't any motive at that point. I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do with my life.、Um, there was no job, you know. It, it wasn't like we were moving to Austin for a job or anything like that.、Mm. Um, but so, so after college, we got married and and just ended up moving to Austin. Uh, which we loved, and and it was just a, a great city to to be in, in our early twenties,、uh, married, and、um, it was really kind of happenstantial that I met the the people that I did there, and and got involved in in acting and and the movie scene there, and again just got really lucky to to work with the people that I did, which gave me. You know, more work to put in demo reels and more work to put in acting reels, and gave me experience and and learning options that I that I then took to to the next stage of my life, which was which was actually going out there and deciding that I wanted to do voice acting full time.、Mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when you met her parents, did you have all those tattoos? <laughs>、um, I got my first tattoo. When I was twenty-two,、um, it was after we had been、uh, we we met when I when we were eighteen. Like I said, we <laughs> met we met right in, at the beginning of college. I got my first tattoo right after we got married. Nice.、Um, my last name is Rudd, and and my wife's name is Kayleen, and my first tattoo is the is the word crud,、um, <laughs> which is. A joke that we had always had, you know. I was mud and she was crud, and、uh, and it's on my wedding ring. You know, it's etched on the inside. It says "Love you always,、oh. crud."、Oh. Um, but so, so that was my first tattoo.、Um, and you know, people have made fun of me over the years, like, "Oh, you never get your girlfriend's name tattooed or your wife's name tattooed on your arm." And I, you know, for me, it's just like, even if. If God forbid something happened and, and we weren't together, it's still hilarious to have the word "crud" tattoo, tattooed on your arm. <laughs> I I know it's not gonna happen. So <laughs> no, I know. Forget、um, the haters, please. Yeah. <laughs> but but yeah, I mean, from then that was let's see, I was twenty two, so that was fifteen、uh, years ago. No, thirteen years ago. For the, so for the last thirteen years, I've been、uh, I've been collecting. Tattoos all over my arms. I've limited myself. Th- this is an artist thing, also. When given an open canvas, you're just going to fill it in.、Um, <laughs> and so I've limited myself. I'm only going to get arm tattoos, and I'm 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 most of the way filled in at this point. But、uh, wow, yeah, it's been 13 years.、Uh, color. All of my tattoos are, are like full color, and so people don't always know this, but but that takes a lot more time and a lot more money. 
you have to go in for a line session and a shading session and a color session. Then you have to wait for everything to heal and then possibly go back in for more color sessions because the colors fade or they don't always show up the way you wanted them to. Um, so yeah, it's been 13 years of, of same artist. Um, for about the first 10 years. Yes. Uh, when I was in Austin, uh. I, I saw the same guy every time. Um, and moving to LA, I spend a long time trying to find someone who I felt was, was a similar style or a similar, um, quality that I was looking for. And, yeah. and I found a great guy, uh, who's actually, he's actually kind of far away. He's about a two hour drive from, from where I live. But, um, but yeah, he's great. Um, and so I've, I've had two, uh, full pieces done by him since moving out to LA. Right, let's do, let's do some plugs. I know we have audience members <laughs> listening in Austin as well. Yeah. Who are these people? So, uh, so Jeremy Miller, uh, was the first guy that ever tattooed me, um, out in Austin. He was on the first season of Ink Master, um, which is mm. not, it's not why I chose him. He actually got cast huh. in Ink Master after I had gotten my first tattoo from him. But it's always a, an interesting selling point. Being like, oh, yeah, I got tattooed by the guy on Ink Master. <laughs> you know, um, he has since kind of retired from tattooing, though. He, he's he's an extremely successful and interesting guy. Um, owned his own tattoo shop, uh, grew it into a very, very successful business where he employs uh, five or six other artists and kind of got to the top of that. He, he got his master's in business. He, he actually got his doctorate in business and, and he started teaching at the, uh, at the college level. And, nice. um, and shortly after I moved, uh, came out here to LA, he told me that he was, he was retiring. Uh, he had just gotten remarried at that point and, and they were just going to kind of live their lives and, and, uh, and enjoy life, not in the, in the parlor every single day. And so his business is still out there. It's called Pigment Dermographics um, in northern Austin. And, uh, uh, yeah, if anyone out there is looking for an amazing uh, quality tattoo, uh, I, I would look them up. And then, uh, and then out here, uh, James Mullins is the guy that, uh, that I actually, I, after my exhaustive search that I, I landed on, and he is... Ooh, I don't even know what the place is called, but it's way out of time <laughs> or way out of town. L look up James Mullen and you'll find him and you'll see why, I, you know, why I went with him. Um, but and it's worth the drive for sure. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. And and that kind of brings us to the next part of the story. When you decided to come out to L.A., um, it couldn't have been an easy decision, right? Or was it? I don't know. How did that come about? Well, it was interesting. I, um, I, I'm sure that you've heard this a ton of times from from other actors that you're talking to. But it takes like it takes like 10 years of of, of really uh, really, really working and clawing and, and climbing the ladder before you really see a lot of benefit or, you know, before this becomes a full fledged career and, 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 you know, talk to any actor and they'll tell you that, you know, it doesn't just happen. There, there are very, very few instances where someone just gets lucky and walks into the right situation and, and gets hired and then has a whole career out of it. And, and so, in Austin, you know, I, I lived there for about 10 years, I think maybe 12 years total. Um, but for about 10 of those, I was really just doing that. Every night, I would, you know, my family would go to sleep and I would be in my office recording demos, recording auditions, you know, just mm. kind of living two lives. Because like I said, I was teaching during the day. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'd come home, you know, spend time with my family. They'd all go to sleep. And then I'd spend several hours into the, you know, into the late night, early morning just sending out emails, sending out demos, recording auditions, you know, that kind of thing. And I I booked several things. I booked some video games. I booked some commercial work. But it was very clear, and again, anyone will tell you this, that you have to be in L.A. to really push yourself to the next level. There are plenty yeah. of opportunities in other cities for commercial work and for some like I said, some video game work, some animation work, but really if you want to be, if you want to say that you're a voice actor and you want to have the opportunity to make money as a voice actor, you need to be in a big city like New York or LA. Mm -hmm. And um, so at the point where uh, 
where where my wife was ready to my wife and I were both teachers. Uh, we both taught art, and then she started. Uh, she started being more interested in administration in education and uh, and changing kind of preconceptions and notions in education. And so at the point where she was ready to transition from her current job to a more administrative job, huh. um, we kind of sat down and had a conversation. And she's, she, I'm going to say that I'm so lucky to have her. She kind of said, hey, I know that you need to be in L.A., and I and I'm ready to change my job at this point. I'm going to only start looking for jobs in L.A. And that wow. way, you know, that way the money isn't on your shoulders. You know, I I can have a job and we can move out there. And at this point, we had a three year old. So uh, so money was an issue. We weren't just you know, I would have never made that choice to say, OK, I expect you guys to drop everything, move to L.A. with me <laughs> and then yeah. give me the opportunity to spend several years trying to make it work in L.A. Um, so, so she brought it up. She came to me and she said, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to look in LA. There's some promising job opportunities. And really within weeks, she was hired, uh, as a, as a coordinator at a school and we were on the road. So yeah, it was a very quick thing. Um, (laughs) like I said, it all kind of fell into place that it worked out for that immediate moment to transition. And and so we picked up and we took a light, a nice long road trip. Uh, you know, did all the sightseeing, went to the Grand Canyon, all that stuff. Visited my family in New Mexico on the way, and <laughs> um, and we got out here. And and we, you know, I've only been to in L.A. for about two years at this point, but it was so amazing. And hopefully, this is kind of this is what I try to tell people who are first starting in voice acting. Yeah. When you've spent the time getting to the point that you need to be, like I said, the the five, ten years that it takes to really understand how the craft works and all the moving pieces and everything, you will find that the, that everything fits into place. Like when you're ready, the world will will accept that readiness. And and so I was ready. I moved out here and it was incredibly fast. <sighs> for me to start working. Um, I, I was shocked, you know, and, and it's only, I mean, I mean, let me back up and say that it's only incredibly fast in the sense that that transition happened. And within the first two years of being in LA, I'm, I'm working and successful, but that's not, you know, discounting the 10 years that I spent before right. in Austin kind of spinning my wheels, you know? It's not a typical experience for a voice actor, and you came prepared, right, right? That's, in your craft that's and the in big your difference. knowledge. If I had moved out here 10 years ago, I would have spent, you know, those 10 years doing exactly what I did in Austin, and uh, and then at this point be ready to move on and, and do more things. It just, it takes that experience and it takes that time and effort uh, to, to do those things. I think it's a really great lesson for anybody who's listening that's not in L.A., who's thinking about, you know, seriously about advancing their career in voiceover to, you know, to do their work, to put the work in, get ready, prep yourself and train yourself and get ready for that move as you have. And even then, when you come out here, success is not guaranteed. Right. Absolutely. Right? At the same time, that preparing oneself for that transition as best they can with what they have, I guess, yeah. would only provide the best opportunities and best chances. Yeah. Why wouldn't you do that? And, and again, I am a family person who is extremely lucky that my wife was providing an income that, you know, that allowed me to spend my entire day once we, once we did move out to L.A., spend my entire day trying to achieve this goal there Mm. there are plenty of people that want to achieve this goal and also have to provide you know financially for themselves and so you know they're working waiting jobs or they're working whatever day jobs they have and then they have to come home and do what i did back in austin come home and spend their nights trying to pursue this other job and so i i i i hold heartedly feel that that you know my rapid success once moving out to Los Angeles is in no small part uh due to the fact that my wife was was so encouraging and so able to take that burden off of my shoulders so that I could just focus all of my energy on pursuing voice acting. Mm. 
well, sounds like somebody's getting a glass of wine and a bouquet of roses and some chocolate. Yes, yes. <laughs> so. No, I, I mean, I, I thanked her every day, you know, <laughs> and, I, and I still do. You know, it's it's it was crazy that that I was given that opportunity, you know, because because mm. like I said, I would not have taken that chance on my family. You know, I, I would not have just said, hey, I'm going to I'm going to drop everything else, go out to L.A. and uh and see if we survive. <laughs> right, you know, right. You don't do that when you have a three-year-old. I'm with you. I, I, no sooner would I have gotten a nine-to-five job that I absolutely hate. I, in before to support the family before right. I pursued my dreams in LA. Right, right. Of course. Right. <laughs> but you're here. Things happen. So let's talk about your work. <laughs> yeah. I'm a huge. By the way, I'm a huge fan of Tower of God yeah. and especially Rock. <laughs> yeah, man. For again, we talked about this, but you are the English voice of Rock. Yes, I'd like to. I'd like you to walk us through the entire process, uh, coming ac- coming across the audition, sending in the audition, finding out how, finding out that you booked it, working with Studio Polis, and your experience in working as Rock. Woo! Yeah. So so. Again, uh, spending my entire life knowing and understanding voiceover and and the people that are a part of it um, and, and understanding what my vocal qualities were like, um, I have I've spent a lot of time uh, trying to mimic other actors that I feel like I fall in the range of. And um, Kevin Michael Richardson is is an actor. If you don't know him, look him up. He's been in every cartoon that you've ever seen. <laughs> and Rock Wraith Razor is very much Kevin Michael Richardson's uh, Shredder voice or his oh. I'm trying to think of other. I mean, he was in Shred- He was in Ninja Turtles. The, the 2012 Ninja Turtles cartoon is great. If, if you haven't watched it, I hear your kids. <laughs> <laughs> um, but 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 my my rock is is very much me spending years practicing getting those lower registers and having that graveliness that I appreciated about Kevin Michael Richardson's voice. Nice. And so, so from time to time, um, I'll get auditions for these giant characters, and that's what I do. I, I do that really guttural, uh, in-the-throat uh, Kevin Michael Richardson voice. And, um, you know, one of the greatest... I don't know that anyone would ever listen to rock and say, oh, that's a Kevin Michael Richardson impression. <laughs> but but one of the greatest, you know, pieces of advice that you ever hear as a voice actor is that even a bad impression is an interesting voice that you have come up with, you know? Indeed. And, and so so this was my somewhat passable impression of of the type of vocal quality that, that Kevin Michael Richardson uh, provides. So oh. anyway, um, it it was a super quick turnaround. And, th- and that's the crazy thing about being a voiceover artist is you do five, ten auditions a day, five, ten auditions a week, a hundred auditions a week, you know, whatever it is. And you're always waiting to hear back, but when you get cast in something, it happens really quickly. You know, yep. you, you do the audition, you get cast sometimes that same week, sometimes the next week, but it's always quicker. Um, right. An interesting part about being a good voice actor is understanding the musicality of your vocal cords, right? And understanding mm-hmm. that it's kind of like playing an instrument and and you can you can produce sounds from certain parts of your body that sound differently. So that is to say that, you know, one of my audition takes was very nasally and like i am rock wraith razor you know up there like that sort of thing and one of them was the kevin michael richardson which was like i am rock wraith razor you know down there they liked them both and so (laughs) it's really interesting for me to to listen to the episodes because in the first few episodes it was really kind of trying to figure out which one of those we were going to go with and you can really hear it you know when you're when you're (laughs) listening for it like i am you can really hear me not really knowing which one I was going to do. Some of them are super deep. Some of them are super uh, nasally. And by about the fourth episode, I feel like we got there. Um, I I feel like it, you know, I listened to that. It it only came out maybe two weeks ago or whatever. And I listened to that for the first time. And I was like, okay, here's where we're going to be good from now on. You know, that sort of thing. (laughs) A big reason why I advocate for improv training for all actors. Absolutely, you need it anywhere, everywhere. Yeah. My gosh. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, 
We keep bringing Ryan up. You know, I know you know this, but uh, <laughs> Ryan, Colt, Levy, and I are, are best friends. You know, we we do a lot together, and and we've kind of been on this journey together. You know, since since moving to LA. Um, Getting coffee together, yeah, yeah. very romantic. Yeah, yeah, we got a nice bromance going on. But I, I keep bringing him up because he's been a part of my life, you know, since moving to LA, and and really we've kind of talked all of these things through together about our successes and our failures and stuff like that. But he and I are 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 so polar opposite in the way that we prep for these things because I'm so 100 percent improv. That's my take on it. Ryan is totally opposite where he does so much research and he comes so much more prepared for every project. And uh, and and honestly, that's the better way to be. However, <laughs> I'm bringing this up because we're talking improv. It is so important yeah. to know that things aren't always going to be prepped for you and to yeah. be able to walk into a room and whether it's confidence or not, have that ability to just say, OK, I'm going to listen to the direction and I'm going to give it my best, and I'm going to change where I need to change, you know? Whether or not you're getting it right on your first try, uh, sometimes it has to do with you, but sometimes it doesn't, and it's just part of the process, you know? It's, it's, it's nothing to feel self-conscious about, um, because you're there for a reason. They like the way you sound. And a lot of times we as actors get hung up on this thing, and, and I certainly did uh, for Rock Wraithraiser, because, again, I had a very clear intent when I went in yeah. and said, I'm doing Kevin Michael Rich Richardson here. And I knew that that was a hard thing to sustain. He's a giant man and he's got giant vocal <laughs> cords. And, and for me, it's a struggle to do that. And so for those first few episodes, you know, I left thinking, oh man, I didn't do that the way I wanted to. Um, and it took about three or four episodes for me to understand that, no, we were figuring out what this character sounds like from me. You know, exactly. coming from me, not coming from Kevin. And and it took a little while to get there. And you, you go back and you watch any animation. I, I just started Futurama over again for like the millionth time that I've watched it. <laughs> um, ask my family how many times I've watched the nice. entire series. And it's it's <laughs> staggering. I mean, but, but I, I started again. And those voices are totally different in the first season than they become over the course of 10 seasons, you know? And, and it's uh, absolutely it's figuring that out. And no one's going to go tell Billy West that his, you know, that his <laughs> his Dr. Farnsworth from episodes one, two and three was terrible. It's just that's where it was at that point. And it got it got to a point where it was different. And I would say it was better, but it takes time and it takes collaboration and it takes, um, you know, the group work to get to that point where you understand, oh, this is what that character is. Right. Yeah, Absolutely. And did you have to go through the same process to find the voice for Ball in the uh, Demon School Yurumakun? So, so that's funny. Um, Ball and and Leaky Eyed Luca and, and several other characters that I've done for Bang Zoom have they're, they're basically just me being a jerk. I mean, that's 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 the <laughs> long and short of it. Um, and and that's right. and that's a voice that really comes naturally to me. You know that sort of thing. You, you you hear all sorts of voice actors, and you can pick them out. You know, in the cartoons, you say, "Oh yeah, <laughs> I, I think that's Billy West," or you know, "I think that's Eric Bowser," or whatever, uh, right. because you understand that they have a certain vocal quality. And, and so, Ball is really just close to my own natural voice when I'm just kind of being a little bit more of a jerk and a little bit more evil. <laughs> Is it fun to be in the same project with Ryan in two different uh, enterprises, no less? Oh yeah, I mean, I, I think I think Demon School was the first one that we uh, that we had that experience. It was like, oh yes, we're both we're finally working on something together, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah, it, it's been interesting because because again, of vocal qualities, I am more likely to be cast as bad guys in more kind of adult themed projects, whether it be video games or animation or whatever. And Ryan has a much more youthful sounding voice. And so we haven't really crossed paths a lot. And and uh, Demon School is is one of the first instances where it's like, well, it's a it's a show about a bunch of kids that have youthful voices. And then there's also this, you know, this jerky bad guy in it. So. <laughs> so, yeah, it was really great. And that, that was that was very exciting for us, you know, of course. Uh, to, to realize that we were in the same project together. How did the two of you cross paths uh, as friends? Well, it, it started uh, social media is, is how we first got uh, in contact. And uh, 
he I mean, if you if you follow Ryan on any sort of social media, you know how outgoing he is and how uh, giving he is with his time. And and he and I, I'm not necessarily against that for myself. I, I'm just not I'm not as outgoing as he is with 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 social media. And so yeah. so when I first moved here and I first started working and everything, he reached out to me and it was like, oh, hey, you know, hey, really awesome to see you doing this great work. You know, that uh, let's let's get together sometime and get a coffee. And immediately it was like, oh, red flag. I don't know if I want to meet some <laughs> random stranger that, I, you know. Right. But, you know, through multiple interactions and, and realizing that we both uh, love playing video games and we both love cartoons, you know, we, we, we became friends on all of our our video game consoles and, and all of our social medias. And we, we had several conversations, which eventually led to us uh, hanging out. The rest is history. <laughs> As they say, sure. <laughs> uh, what does leaky eye Luca mean? I said, that's such a terrible question. <laughs> Let me rephrase that. <laughs> Why is he so leaky? <laughs> yeah, maybe that's the one. I mean, Jojo's Bizarre Adventure is a, is a title that's not light by any chance, by, by right. any means, by the fans especially. I mean, what do the fans think about Leaky Eye Luca with your voice on it? Well, let me, yeah, again, let me give you way too much information for the question you asked. Um, <laughs> Perfect. But, uh, apparently, we are all realizing that that's what I do. Um, <laughs> I was so excited about uh, about JoJo's because I know the you know the pedigree of it. I know the his, the the importance of it to to the fandom. Um, I have I have a few friends that are from Japan and and have watched these as they've aired. You know when they were kids and they're they're all now coming to America and and being translated and everything. But um, I have a specific friend Tatsuma from Austin who. You know, from the from the get go, when I started doing voiceover stuff, he's like, "Oh, you got to get on JoJo." You know, I've been watching it since I was a kid. You know, it's it's the coolest thing in the world. And so when I got cast for it, I immediately knew the the uh, importance of of the show and and how cool <laughs> it was. And again, as actors, we are not given much information about the project before we walk in. And so it was much to my dismay to find out that Leaky Eye Luca is a one episode character he's you know one and done um but despite that um i i've had tons of fans reaching out to me and, and telling me how cool they think leaky eye luca is and you know of course i think he's cool but um yeah he's not even he's not one of these uh you know full arc bad guys or whatever he was really just the introduction to the latest season of jojo and you know what i don't know why he has a leaky eye <laughs> When I, you know, I, I mentioned my friend Tatsuma, when I told him that I got cast as, as Leaky Eye Luca, he goes, oh, cool. He's like that Bond guy. You know, you'll love him. He's like the guy from, um, what's the first, uh, the first Daniel Craig, uh, Casino Royale. He, he's the guy that's constantly, his, his eyes constantly bleeding blood. Um, he's like yeah. that guy. You'll love him. And and I went in there, you know, again, not knowing anything to expect and then being pretty disappointed when I found out he died in that same episode. Um, hmm. But it was one of those. That was one of the first experiences uh, where I realized, again, that mommy cast me to play a certain character because I, you know, <laughs> I went. Mommy Okada. Yeah, I went in there, you know, giving it my, you know, what I, what I thought he'd sound like. And, and again, the direction was, uh, can you make him sound more like a jerk? You know, can you? <laughs> And I, I, I'm not insulted, but what she means when she says more like a jerk is she wants him to sound more like me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I've, I was in a few uh, conferences and, and Zoom meetings with Mami Okada, uh -huh. and she seems uh, like like a producer who producer director who really knows what she wants. Oh yeah, very specifically. Yeah, yeah it's 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 very refreshing to work with people like that. Um, yeah. is so much of so much of any filmmaking or acting or or voiceover or anything is like I said figuring it out as you go and a lot of times I have felt like I'm in the position where I have to figure things out that other people aren't prepared to figure out right and it's not that way you know when you walk into a studio session that mommy's in charge of or and, and that's not even mommy's not not even the uh, the director in these sessions, but she is so sure of what she wants when she's casting people 
that, um, you know, it's, it's really nice to see that come through into the direction, into the session and, and just have a clear, you know, a clear path to follow. We're not, we're not just shooting yeah. in the dark. Clear vision yeah. and, and a means to get yeah. there. Absolutely. All right. Talk to us about Grand Blue Fantasy versus. Oh, that was, you know, I'm, I'm going to start every conversation saying this, but I was so excited. <laughs> <laughs> I was so excited to get cast as this. Um, Excellent. It, it was a PS4 exclusive uh, video game, which was awesome. I, I had done, up until this point, I've done a few video games, uh, but many of them were mobile games or games that I wasn't necessarily interested in playing myself. And as I told you, I'm a big video game player. Um, yeah. And PlayStation has always been my my go-to console. So finding out that I had been cast in a current generation PlayStation 4 exclusive was super exciting for me because, you know, career-wise, it's a showpiece, right? You, you've got this awesome footage to show off. It looks beautiful. It sounds beautiful. It's a genre yeah. that I like, you know, that sort of thing. It's a character that, I, that I'm proud of doing. But, but, you know, personally, you know, not just to show off career stuff, but personally, I'm going to play it. You know, it's a game that I want to play. It's, a, it's a, on, a, on a console that I like to play. Nice. Um, so, so that was super cool. And... Uh, and Belial was a character that I did kind of one of those off the wall auditions for, um, ah. which is interesting because because like I said, I I I have often at this point been cast as just my own voice with a little bit of grit to it and a little bit of uh, you know jerkiness to it. Um, but with Belial, he's super sexual, um, and and there's a lot of uh, grand blue fantasy. Uh, fans, you know that that show is is super sexualized. That property is super sexualized, and and right. Belial himself, almost every line that he has is some sort of innuendo, and so it was a lot more. I don't know the the audition that I did was a lot more snaky and a lot more seductive, you know, and and oftentimes when I'm voicing him in the studio, I'm actually like kind of moving my body in like a serpentine kind of way just to kind of feel that vibe coming out of me. And, and so, so that was huh. that was cool because oftentimes you'll see that where you realize that you did something different in the audition that maybe other people didn't do, and that's what got you noticed. Yeah. And so that, that was cool. That was one of the first times that that, that kind of happened for me. It was like, uh, I don't really know what to do with this. I'm going to do something left field that I wouldn't normally do, and, and it worked out, you know? Took a chance, and you stood out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's funny because... It's it's a really long lived series in Japan. It's a it's a really beloved series. It's got a it started with a mobile game, which has gone on for years at this point. There's a, a season of of an anime at this point, and Belial is super beloved from the mobile game. He hasn't made it to the anime yet. This was the first time that it was the first time he was going to have an English voice. It was the first time that he was going to be in a in a you know PlayStation big screen video game. And uh, and so they really had the, the producers really had a lot of a lot of energy behind it, like a lot of nerves, maybe like they wanted mm. to get this right. They had to get it right because the fans were so right. so ravenous about him. And uh, and so the sessions were interesting. Uh, you know, I've done I, I'd, I'd probably say five or six or seven sessions of him at this point. And every session another producer would be in there because they're such a fan. They'd be like, huh. oh, we really loved what you did in the first one. And uh, and now <laughs> we've brought on this other person because they have some input on, you know, what they want you to pull out for this next one. Cause it, and it was it was never like a criticism. It was just like, oh, I love this character so much. Uh, let's try to do this <laughs> with his voice, you know. And it seems like every session we have new people coming in. Uh, wow. You know, again, and it's really funny because they're kind of geeking out. They're kind of fa yeah. fanning out as they're directing me <laughs> on what to do. Um, so, so anyway, I mean, it, that's been a really fun process. And, and that was at Mark Grau Studios, um, which is another great studio in town. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to call these studios out because so much of um, maybe your audience, uh, so much of this job is, is finding the right people, right? Yes. And understanding you know, th this is a big difference between how I was in Austin and how I am in L.A. is I didn't understand who I needed to talk to to get the jobs. I didn't understand what the actual process is. And 
and being in LA, you're kind of forced to to figure that out or else you're not going to succeed. And so so understanding that you don't you don't try to contact uh, you know the publisher Bandai Namco to try and get a job to to be in their video game. <laughs> These are all recorded at different studios around town, and those studios oftentimes have their own casting director, right? right. So anyway, this was at Mark Grau, which is another amazing, wonderful studio in town, and and just delightful sessions. There there are always evening sessions for this game because we're we're simul we're we're being directed by a booth director here, but also simultaneously being by directed by someone in Japan. And so it has mm. to be a time time, yeah, a time zone thing. Yeah. So it's always like a 5 p.m. to 10 p.m. session. And uh, and so we're all a little bit loopy. It's the end of the day. It's it's the early yep. morning for them. And so, you know, it, it's it's a fun time. <laughs> and and definitely knowing the right people will open the right doors. And you found your right door and the right person at Dean Panero Talent. Yeah. Talk to me about working with Dean. Yeah, I can't, <laughs> again, I'm going to say I'm so lucky. I was moving to L.A. understanding that this was going to be an uphill climb. You know, understanding that it was going to take years for me to get where I wanted to go. And mm. understanding that, you know, the process is you get a director or sorry, you get a agent that you can at the time that you can. And then after a couple of years of work, you maybe move on to a bigger agency. And then, you know, and, and you just keep climbing that ladder for your entire career. Right. I mean, that, until you end up at Abrams. Sure. sure. <laughs> and so the fact that that I got Dean uh, a little under a year after I first moved here. Was, wow. was such a huge thing. I mean, it was like, it was like, I don't even know what to do because like, I thought this was going to be 10 years from now, you know, or I thought this was <laughs> going to be five years from now. Um, but it's happening right now. And it is, it is so cool to have the, the star power uh, behind you. The, the, I mean, Dean's a, Dean's a rock star. He's, he's well known. Um, he is, he's getting the auditions that, you know, that you can't get by yourself. It's just, it's Correct. just a fact of the matter, you know, no matter how successful you are as an independent person, which I was for years, there's, there's a level that you can't achieve because of, I mean, I don't want to say gatekeeping or anything like that, but there, there's the, the bigger productions, your Disney's, your DreamWorks, you know, your bigger video game companies, uh, they don't just put out a casting call on Twitter, you know, uh, they <laughs> exactly. they have pipelines they go through and and, and <laughs> those pipelines are are agents they have preferred agents and and you know so if you are lucky enough to get in with one of those preferred agents your job's not it's not like you're coasting for the rest of your career but you have the benefit of getting 5 10 auditions a week you know or more yeah. that that yeah. that are pretty big projects you know and so you're still putting in the work. You're still auditioning for hundreds of things and never hearing back about them. But they're big projects. You know, they're things that you can't get on your own, and they're things that that you, that pay that pay well. You know, it's it's right. a different it's a different level. And so, all of that is to say that I'm just so extremely lucky that this happened earlier on in my career. I will have I will have years of experience with this level of 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 the business that I thought I would have to wait for another five years to get, you know? <laughs> what is Dean like in person? Oh, he's super cool. Um, <laughs> w one of these things uh, that, you know, you know, every, everyone needs to find their people. Um, sure. And, and what works for me doesn't work for everyone. Uh, what works for Ryan doesn't work for everything. What works for you, uh, for you doesn't work for everyone, right? Um, yeah. When I walked in for our meeting with Dean, or for my meeting with Dean, he was we were dressed like the same, right? We're we're wearing we're wearing <laughs> t-shirts with like a blazer over it. We both have these cool colorful sneakers on and then some some jeans on. And when you look around the office, that's the environment that he has created in his office. He he's he's a cool guy. He surrounds himself with cool people. I love everyone that works in the office there. And, and so, so I was instant. All that to say, I was instantly put at ease. It, we had a conversation. Yeah. We talked about uh, very uh, a, about a lot of the stuff that you and I are talking about right now. How how I right. got to the place where I am, 
And it was an instant connection, right? It was instantly we were both at ease. Instantly we both liked each other. And that's important. I've had a lot of agents in my career so far that that's not the case. They they right. treat you badly. They talk to you like you're not worth their time or or they or they talk to you in a way that is not the way that you talk to people, you know, professional. Yeah. yeah. Well, and it's not not only that, because because <laughs> professional for one person is different for, from professional for another person. But that's true. Suffice to say that when I am talking to Dean or when I'm talking to the people that work in Dean's office, we have a camaraderie and, a, and an equality in the way that we exchange and the way that we communicate. And it's something that I've looked for for a long time in my career that I haven't been happy with with other agencies that I've been with. Um, and, and so, so that's, that's a great feeling. And, um, you know, I, I'm for, for people that are listening who haven't found that or don't have that with the current agency that you have, there's no shame in continuing to look for it. And it's not that Dean is going to be that person for everyone, but he's that person for me. And, and, and it's, it's a really good feeling to have that person, you know, in your corner, repping you the way that you want to be repped. Nice. Oh, that's that's perfect. Um, I, I want to get I want to get a bit of a, a summative reflection piece, if you don't okay. mind. Um, starting out in Albuquerque, moving to Austin, working your tail off, moving to L.A., getting representation and working on these big things, union and agents mm-hmm. and wife, <laughs> life, kids. Yeah. My God. And as a 35 year old looking back. What do you make of all of this? How quickly it's all happened and and who do you have to thank and <laughs> and and like how did you get here? So so something that can't be understated is that every new step is just the first step to something else. And so, a, a conversation that I've had with a lot of people, whether it's old students or, or uh, you know, peers in the voiceover industry or the acting industry, is that if you don't have the passion to think of every next step as the first step for your next thing, right, then you're going to burn out. Mm. And, you know, to bring it back to what I was saying before, that's why thinking creatively and being a problem solver is such an important skill in any aspect of life. But the way I use it in my in my life is understanding that, yes, I was I was able to move to L.A., you know, with the help of my wife. And, yes, I was able to get Dean a lot earlier than I thought I would in my career and yes, I'm working on things after two years of being in L.A. that I thought it would take more like 10 years to be working on, right? But also understanding that these are the very baby beginning steps of what I will be doing over the next 10 years, mm. right? Um, and, and so just looking back at my life the way that, you know, you're asking about, there's always been a drive that exists because of that understanding, understanding that I'm never done. I'm never standing still, that I'm always achieving this step and looking towards the next step. Right. And some people will caution you that that's not that's not always the healthiest way to look at things. A lot of times you have to sit back and enjoy the position that you're in and and take a look and say, dang, I achieved a lot this year. I'm really proud of myself. You know, it's, it's, it's harmful to always be thinking of yourself as insufficient in some way and, and to try to do the next best thing all the time. Sure. However, a combination of those two attitudes is really beneficial, mm-hmm. where you can be proud and confident of who you are and really, and really understand the success and the luck that you've had in your life, but also understand how much hard work it took to get there and how much hard work you still have to go to where you want to be, right? Because I haven't done things that I want to do. You know, every every year or, you know, every time I achieve something, I say, okay, I got to the next level. Now, what's the next goal? What is the next goal, <laughs> Matthew? Well, I've been super successful in in the dubbing world, in, in, in doing localization for Japanese animations, in, in playing, uh, playing characters in video games from Japan. I've had success in, in original content as well. 
However, I have not done the original character that is the equivalent to Belial on PS4, right? Uh. I have not done the original character for the PS4 game or the PS5 game that I would love to be the first person to take a stab at that, you know? Hmm. I have not done the original character for a Disney animation or for an American animation whose entire performance was animated based on my performance, right? Right. That, that's my next goal, you know? And, and, you know, I don't feel bad about, about saying that I haven't achieved that, right? Um, but that, that, is, that is a measure of success for me that I haven't, not, that I haven't yet gotten to. Wow. Right? I, that, that, is, that is my next big thing. Wow. Big goals. <laughs> I mean, right. well, you, you, you should definitely have big goals. Absolutely. Right. Well, and, and, and that also just comes from an understanding of, of, of the industry that we're in. And not to say that different levels are worse than other levels, but dubbing animation is a level of this industry right. that you can have a lot of success in and, and people have built careers on. But the people that are the names that you know from cartoons who maybe started as dubbing animation actors um, have used those as stepping blocks to get to what I'm talking about, where, where they are the original creators of, of original characters. And I, I would love to be a part of that. And I know that's just around the corner for me, you know. And, you know, and, and that's that's exactly what I'm talking about when when we talk about agencies being able to open doors to certain things, because that is typically not something that a single entity person can get to without the help of an agent. Right. 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 And so if you are if that is a goal of yours, if that is a, an aspiration, then then understanding that pipeline that gets you to that point is is super important for you understanding that you need to surround yourself with the right people and find the right agent that can help you get to that that level because it is a different level even if you know even not to say that 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 the Japanese animation is better or worse than American animation because I know that I know that conversation is <laughs> is happily had by many <laughs> many fans out there but in the industry as far as uh, longevity as far as pay as far as comfort level there is a difference between that. And if, if you're trying to create a career where you are providing for a family, you do have to venture into those waters of, of, of original content. Oh, how exciting. <laughs> no, it really is. I mean, I, I've talked to so many different voice actors from around the world who are all in different places in their journeys. Right. Some are struggling to find the next class that they can attend. Some right. are, some have original animation voice around the corner, backed by Dean Bonero talent. <laughs> right. And there is a commonality in all of these stories where, where there are goals and you work hard and then you get there by any means necessary, smart right. means necessary, but any means necessary. And it truly is the the collective story of the artist. Yeah, just like you. Yeah. My gosh. <laughs> and it's rather humbling to kind of hear your story as well of because the journey is the same. You're just a lot further ahead than than other people maybe. And if they have the drive that you do, they'll <laughs> get there too. Sure, and and also understand that I feel that way about others. You know, I I look at my own career and like I said, it, it, I have plenty of time to reflect and, and appreciate where I am now, but I'm looking at other people that I grew up idolizing and and seeing the path that their career took. Um, you know, just someone that I talk about all the time is Steve Bloom, right? Mm. He's he's probably first most well known for Spike Spiegel uh, from Cowboy Bebop, right? Yep. I bet he got paid nothing for that. Right. He, he did tons. He did an entire series and he made whatever money was available for a dubbing artist at that time, which I can't imagine that he made <laughs> much on. But he had the foresight to leverage that 
and and take that experience and move on to to you know I'm sure if you talk to him right now he still feels like he's taking baby steps to the next part of his career right <laughs> yeah um you know and and he's working for Lucas Arts right he's he's doing Star Wars animation he's doing everything um but but it's it's important because I've talked to so many people who are in the process uh, you know of of being actors in some way who are bemoaning their position right and and wanting to figure out how to get to the next level and for me it's always been looking to those other people who have inspired me and seeing the path that their career took mm. right otherwise i'd be lost cuz yeah. there's not a, there's not a whole lot of information out there for people you know unless you unless you are doing the research and and you know there's no like baby's guide to <laughs> to becoming a <laughs> successful voiceover artist uh, but you did bring up classes, and I know I'm sure you've talked to plenty of other vo- voiceover artists that that talk about classes, and it is so important to immerse yourself in the community, mm-hmm. even if you're the best actor in the world. Um, I, you know, I came to LA, like I said, with having about ten years of voice acting and acting under my belt, and it was important for me to take classes, not because I was always learning new things, but because I was meeting new people. And what I didn't learn about maybe technique, in some cases, I was learning about process and about how the industry works in L.A. Mm-hmm. And how how my teachers in these classes, who were oftentimes peers of mine, and, you know, crazy enough, like a lot of these people that I first took classes with when I was here, I'm now working on projects with, uh-huh. um, you, you know, to learn how they met people and who they met and, you know, the the differences between work in Austin and work in LA. Uh, that's why class is important to create a community of support and to, and to meet people that can help you w- with your journey. So whether or not you're learning technique in these classes, you know, that, that is awesome. But the people that you meet along the way are, are really the things you take away from those classes. Mm. This really is about who you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, it is. is. <laughs> it is. <laughs> All right. The following questions I ask everyone, um, especially with the quarantine in place, I assume you now, if not before, have uh, uh, your closet booth. I don't know if you had it before. I'd imagine you traveled out to studios to record and, and do work. Um, but for most voice actors around the world um, are working out of their home studios for various reasons. And... Um, I've asked this question to every single voice actor that I've talked to so far because I really think the equipment that we start out with and what we upgrade to are super interesting mile markers of our progress in this industry. Yeah. So the question is, what does your recording space currently look like? And what did you start out with? And what are you using now? Yeah, gr- great question. Um Again, I've always had a love for 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 understanding how things are made and for editing myself. So so from the get go, when I first started acting, uh, or voice acting, recording demos, you know, what have you, I understood the importance of getting the right equipment and and learning the technique and the and the process behind recording and and that sort of thing. So long way to answer your question. I've always had a booth in in one form or another. And and just I mean think about it as as we brought up before you know if you're sending an iPhone video for an audition and the sound you don't have a mic on you it's just coming from the the speaker on your iPhone and and you send that and the next person that sends it to that casting director is using a DSLR camera and they have a shotgun mic and 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 are giving them something of production quality it's not hard to understand why the casting director might go in that direction, right? And that goes for voiceover auditions as well. If you're recording on a on a $35 mic that you got from an Instagram ad, because I'm just bringing that up because I've seen <laughs> plenty of those recently, um, that quality sound is going to be, you know, far underwhelming for a casting director when you've got people who have been in the industry for 20 years sending them stuff from their professional home studios. Um, so so understanding that and understanding, you know, how, how to edit is, is super important. So all of that, you know, getting around to the answer to your question, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I have a bunch of microphones that I use. 
And I'm not a rich person. I, I don't go out and buy microphones that are more than a couple hundred dollars, you know, if that. Um, but I've got some great microphones that, that were inexpensive. Right now I'm talking on a, a, microfo- a shotgun microphone that comes from uh, Vocal Booths to Go, which I know is, is super uh, popular right now because they, yeah. they sell home booths and, and it's a rather affordable situation. So a lot of people that I know in the industry are taking advantage of that. They also make a really nice, clean, super low self-noise uh, shotgun microphone. Uh, it's $150. Oh. Which is which is wonderful. Wow! And it's it, the the sound quality is super flat, which is very appreciated by uh, by audio engineers because then they can tweak the levels and the and the equalization. Uh, they don't have to roll off bass that that you're getting from a super bassy microphone or right. you know or the opposite. Uh, so so that's what I'm using at this point, and and I've been super happy with the results. I've got that going through a DBX. Um, let me look at it right now. 280, uh, 280 something there. 286 S. There we go. DBX 286 S. And that's, uh, that's a pre processing unit. It's got super clean, uh, gain that you can add to your microphone. So if you're, if you're new to this, not every, processor is the same. Not every uh, preamp is the same. Sometimes you turn up the volume and you're going to hear all that, like, (laughs) you know, that kind of background noise. So it's really important to find an affordable, clean source of volume. And so the DBX uh, was, I think, $250 maybe. Um, And with that comes super clean volume, but it also has uh, a noise gate on it which takes out background noise. So when my kid's stomping around, you know, it, it under a certain volume, it will just remove that from your recording so you don't have to spend time editing in post when you have an audition or when you have a recording. It takes it out for you. It also has a compressor so that when I'm being my jerky bad guy characters, <laughs> I can yell as loud as I want to in this tiny booth and it's not going to spike, right? So that was a single unit that provides all sorts of different uh, abilities to, to do some pre-processing so that once I record into my, my digital audio workstation, right, I don't have to then spend minutes or hours of my time editing to take those things out. Right. And, and some of you out there might not even edit at this point. And again, I, I ask you to think about if I'm sending in audio and it's super clean and it sounds like it was professionally produced versus someone who's not necessarily taking out all the clicks clicks and pops and background noise and that sort of stuff you got to think about that in the ears of a of a casting director cuz some of that is just going to exclude you from the conversation right away so anyway <laughs> um that is a analog processing unit though and we need to get that to go into a computer to record right so i have that going through my um Oh, uh, Euphoria UMC 202 HD. <gasps> wow, <laughs> you use the Euphoria. That's amazing. <laughs> tell tell me why that's amazing. <laughs> um, I, I also take part in a lot of uh, aspiring beginning voice actor servers and uh, communities, and Euphoria is often uh, recommended by others and myself included for like budget entry oh, level. You know that kind of a, a pro approach. Yeah, um, I mean it's interesting. Uh, I, again, I don't use it for anything other than being a digital interface. Yeah. And, and I say that because, like I said, with the DBX, I can crank that volume and it sounds beautiful. With the Euphoria specifically, if I start turning up the preamps, which Euphoria is supposed to have really good preamps for the price, you can really hear that crackling and you can really hear that background noise. So I have the preamps turned completely off on my Euphoria. It is simply the go-between uh, going from my microphone to my computer. And that being said, there's a big difference between certain go between certain uh, digital interfaces. The Euphoria has a max capability of, you know, hertz and, and decibels and you know, all, all that technical stuff right. that the Scarlet doesn't. And a lot of the lower end or, or, or uh, budget friendly, I should say, uh, interfaces do, don't. So the the audio resolution of of the Euphoria is is kind of that max home studio setting. Interesting. Um, yeah, w- which is which is good to know. I mean, if 
a lot of people do jump on those sales for the Scarlet, you know, bundle. Uh, you know, it comes with a microphone, comes with the Scarlet, comes with Pro Tools, um, not knowing that their audio signal is actually being compressed into that into that digital interface and then coming out less full than it was when it went oh. into the microphone. Um, I've heard a lot of, of uh, audio engineers, you know, studio engineers that we're now recording with on Source Connect and all that. I've heard a lot of them complaining about that aspect, that, that that's one part of this whole thing that that actors don't always understand is that the interface going into your computer can alter in a negative way, right. in a deconstructive way, um, the audio signal that's coming from your microphone. So a lot of us try to say we have broadcast quality setups, but if you're going through a scarlet into your computer, it is taking that signal and degrading it to a point where it is no longer broadcast quality. Oh, interesting indeed. Yeah. I, I learned something new today. Wow. <laughs> well, you know, and and I try to do my research and I try to buy the best thing that I can afford at the time. I'm I'm always upgrading my stuff. The, this uh, this vocal mic, uh, vocal booth mic, um, I just got the other day because it was recommended by one of the ADR um, studios that I work with uh, because of its flat sound. You know, all that stuff I was saying, it was right. recommended by them. But I just got it the other day because that it was recommended to me and it was only $150, which I know is a is a big price tag for some people, but in the realm of getting broadcast quality audio into your your home booth, $150 versus a, you know, $3,000 <laughs> microphone. The UA7, 10, 000, you know, sure. <laughs> you know, you, the sky's the limit as far as what they'll charge you for these microphones. Uh, I'm getting a good enough quality uh, to work with with these professional studios out of this microphone. So. Fantastic. Wow. <laughs> Enlightening for me, I personally. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Um, okay, next question. Uh, so it's like 1030 and you just got, you just wrapped another session at <laughs> uh, Bang Zoom, maybe. I don't know. And it was a hard day. You know, well, I'll tell then, you what. Bang Zoom only goes till six p.m. They're they're pretty <laughs> they're pretty good about about treating their employees uh, like here here are acceptable working hours, right? Oh wow! Let's say I just mar I just I just wrapped on uh, on uh, Grand Blue Fantasy. It's eleven o'clock at night. <laughs> we'll go with that. Okay, and you need a drink. Sure. And uh, bars are open. Let's pretend. Walk inside. Have a seat. What is your what? What do you get? Um, I get, and you can ask anyone that's ever had a drink with me. I'll ask Ryan. I get what is called a Mexican martini. Ooh. Um, and the again, yeah. Ask Ryan. Uh, <laughs> anytime that we go to a bar, I spend about half the night here in L.A. explaining what a Mexican martini is to the bartender. <laughs> And then going through drink after drink after drink, having them perfected along the way. Right. And about six drinks in when, I, you know, <laughs> when I shouldn't have had six <laughs> drinks, we finally gotten to the point where, where it's a good drink. And then I have one, one more for good measure because they have perfected it at this point. But the Mexican martini was introduced to me in Austin. Um, it is a tequila drink. Uh, it's tequila. It, it, if you could imagine a, a, a margarita on the rocks. Got it. And then adding jalapeno to it <sighs> to give it some spice. Ooh. Um, it's very similar to that. Um, it's a little bit less sweet. You know, I don't like, I don't like my drinks uh, to be super sweet. Uh, something that I don't think you probably know is I have diabetes. I have type 1 diabetes. And so I don't, I don't consume a lot of sugar. Yeah, because, sugar intake is important. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that goes for you know when when I'm out drinking too. But so so anyway, where a margarita might be a little too sugary for me, you know, I, I go for this Mexican martini, which is very much like a margarita, except it's more of the kind of dry sour or not sour, but dry uh, spicy <sighs> thing. Whereas the margarita might be a little more sugary. But tequila is is usually where I will go if I'm uh, if I'm drinking. But to be honest with you, I don't drink hardly at all. Yeah. 
And that's just, again, because you know, we, we started the conversation this way. We might as well end it this way. I'm, I'm 35 and everything I put in my body, you can see. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, uh, I'm not drinking as much as I used to. I'm not eating as much as I used to, you know. Just wait until you turn 40. Yeah, it sucks oh. getting old. <laughs> that's where I am. <laughs> <laughs> 40 years young. Uh, 40 years young. I'll, I, you know, since we're talking about age, I'll just put in a little story of mine as well. Yeah. Um, my birthday passed in April, and we were still very much in the thick of quarantine. And let, let me stop you. What April? What? April thirtieth. Okay, I'm May third, so we are ah so we close. Are birthday twins, almost. <laughs> <laughs> and I had been planning for this fortieth birthday party at my oh, house, man, yeah, for about three months, scheduling people and these things. And I was going to have a dinosaur theme party. <laughs> Cause, <laughs> you cause, know? cause you're the father of a four the, and an eight year old. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, it's got nothing to do with me turning forty. No, uh, <laughs> tablecloths and napkins and bounce houses, all these things. And yeah. I was super excited about uh, making fun of my age. And then I had to cancel everything. <sighs> mm -hmm. It was a it was a terrible day. I changed my uh, changed my avatar profile to a dinosaur on Twitter, and and tweeted every tweet with a roar <laughs> <laughs> the whole day. Um, beautiful story about aging and what makes you what what. <laughs> What yeah. brings joy, I guess. Yeah, this was my <laughs> 35th birthday on May 3rd. And, you know, I, I didn't have grand plans like you, but, uh, but you know, we ended up just not doing anything, of course, you know, ordering some food in and, and kind of we, we ordered sushi and, and I'm sure we watched cartoons, but it was not much different than, <laughs> than a normal evening. Yeah, same here. I just went and got a whole cake and ate it by myself. So <laughs> there's that. Oh. <sighs> what a what a fun story. I, these are really these are really fun stories. Thank you very much for spending some time here with me this afternoon. I hope so, man. I, like ask any of my students that I've had over the years. I I do this way too much where you ask me a question and I tell you everything about my life that has nothing to do with the question and then <laughs> and then I remember that I was supposed to be asking a question or answering a question and, and then I eventually answer it. It makes you who you are. <laughs> it does. And I, I'm looking forward to the day when you, Ryan and I can meet up at a Korean restaurant in yeah. LA somewhere so we can talk more and pig out. Yes, I would love that. Nice. Last question. Are you okay. ready? I'm ready. If the listeners would like to find out more about you and your work, where can they go to find out, find where can they go to find you? Well, uh I, I'm my website is www.sonofrud.com. That's s o n o f r u d d.com. So so general information, uh you know, my past work, you know, my things I'm excited about, I'll post on there. I'm most active on Instagram, um, where that's uh, Matthew David Rudd is my is my Instagram handle, and then uh, you know if you want to follow me on Twitter, I'm at Son of Rudd on Twitter. I, I picked out that name before I had a son, just a lucky lucky coincidence. <laughs> but um, but yeah, I mean I'm I'm not super active on all of those things. I'm probably like I said most active on Instagram, um, but I'm I'm so grateful for these platforms because I, I have been able to to interact with the community so much and, and hear and feel the love for for characters like Rock and characters like Belial and, and Leaky Eyed Luca. Um, it, it is super cool to have that um, that instant accessibility to, to the fan base and, and to other actors out there. Um, so yeah, if you if you wanna if you wanna connect with me, please feel free to follow me on those uh, those accounts and and I will do my best to be to be there talking with you. Beautiful. And I look forward to those photos with the uh, spear at various cons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, I can't wait. I can't wait to bring that out. Awesome. Again, okay, thank you so much for your time and for your stories. Uh, they're filled with like stories and lessons <laughs> and, and advice. I, I never I never intend these episodes to be advice based, but for you, I think with your experience, your narrative and your story, I think a lot of people can learn a lot of things from our your your side of the conversation from from today. So thank you so much. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. This has been Voice Actor Showcase. Visit our website at voiceactorshowcase.com. If you'd like to be featured on this podcast, contact us at voiceactorshowcase.com. Thanks for listening. 
Hello, my name is Eric Howell, and I'm the podcast editor for Voice Actors Showcase. Whoa! Hey, hey, get back! I'm, I'm trying to make a commercial here. Uh, anyways, if you have a podcast that needs editing, or you would like to make a voice acting demo reel, you can reach me at thepodcastdoctor at gmail.com, and I'll be with you right after I slay this dragon. No, you! Come back here! 